So it's a great pleasure to be here and to basically give an overview of fatty liver. And So I have uh, no disclosures related to this talk. And my objectives in the uh, next uh, 30 minutes or so are to talk about who's at risk for steatosis in Mexico, why are they at risk, and how do we diagnose them. And so I'm going to give a little bit of a clinical overview on what you've heard already about NASH and diet also talk about alcohol and ash, and lastly talk about something you may not have heard about, which is environmental or toxicant-associated steatohepatitis. So, as seen here, there are many roads to hepatic steatosis. And so, you've heard about different fats already this morning. In the United States, fructose is a huge problem but also alcohol and environmental toxins can lead to fatty liver. So there are many mechanisms leading to one phenotype. So, this is from a lead article in a journal that we published in a couple years ago talking about this issue and showing that indeed you can develop fatty liver, steatohepatitis, go all the way to cirrhosis, and ultimately to liver cancer through multiple different mechanisms. This is of relevance to Mexico where obviously there's alcohol, there's food that can lead to fatty liver, and there's also environmental toxicity. So, in the United States, we've known about the problem of obesity and almost for two decades now. And about uh, two-thirds of Americans are overweight or obese, 25% have NAFL, and it's a major health problem in the United States and worldwide. So, as we've heard this morning, uh, NAFL and NASH usually presents with just a mild elevation in liver enzymes. Most patients clinically are asymptomatic. The liver biopsy is identical to alcohol, but with no major alcohol consumption. And this was first described in 1980, so we don't have nearly as long a history of this as we do alcoholic liver disease. It's by far the number one cause of abnormal liver enzymes in the United States. It occurs in about 25% of Americans, but as I'll show you, this is a global problem, and you've heard about this earlier. And you've seen some of this data presented in a different form uh, from Zobar Yanasi. So when I used to talk about NAFL, I used to think that this was a North American problem, problem in the United States. And then when I would talk at the liver meetings, why uh, people from Europe would get up and say, well, geez, we see this in Europe without a lot of obesity. And indeed, if you look at South America, you have more NAFL than we do in the United States. What are the Epidemiologic risk factors, well, they're very similar from one part of the world to another. So obesity, uh, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, things that you've heard about this morning. But an important factor is in the United States, we have a much higher rate of obesity than much of South America. So for us, it's easier to identify patients at risk.
So why do we care about this? Well, you know, you may think people are gonna be dying of liver disease, but actually the number one risk factor for death in these patients is cardiovascular events. And we'll emphasize this. Also, disease progression is important. And lastly, people can develop uh, liver cancer. So if you look at the factors that can cause NAFL, they're also the factors that can cause cardiovascular disease. So similar risk factors. And this is just highlighted in one study where they looked at uh, carotid uh, intimal thickness. And as you can see, patients with NAFL had greater thickness than controls. And it was worse in those that had NASH than those with simple steatosis. So cardiovascular problems are a big risk factor. Fibrosis is very important. So Paul Angulo, who was at Kentucky for a long period of time, uh, did these original studies showing that the more severe the fibrosis, the worse your outcome. And fibrosis also, again, as we showed, is worse for a cardiovascular outcome and not only a liver outcome. What about the natural history? Well, it's not totally well defined because again, we've only had a relatively short period of time to study this. But we know now that it's a, NASH is a major cause for liver transplantation. It's usually slowly progressive, and we're increasingly recognizing this in children. Indeed, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, about 15 years ago, we first described NAFL in children as being more prevalent in Hispanic children, which we now widely recognize. And importantly, it's an increasing cause of liver cancer. How do we diagnose NAFL? Well, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So sometimes we have to do liver biopsies to uh, see how far the patients have progressed. But as we'll talk about later, we're gonna look for better biomarkers. And when we talk about a disease of exclusion, we have to then rule out other common causes. And the two that I'm gonna talk about today are alcohol and environmental problems. When do we suspect NAFL? Well, again, the history usually isn't very helpful because they're usually not complaining of anything except maybe fatigue. Uh, if you have mildly elevated liver enzymes with any of the following, you need to think about it. Obesity, uh, type two diabetes, the metabolic syndrome, sleep apnea where you get uh, hepatic hypoxia, insulin resistance. So these are all important factors to think about. What are the tests that we use to exclude other diagnoses? Obviously, you rule out viral hepatitis. You rule out alcohol-related liver disease, autoimmune liver disease, uh, hereditary or congenital causes like hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and drug-induced liver disease. In laboratory tests, you usually have a elevated AST and ALT, especially ALT, but that's not always true. The data says it's 10% of people will have normal tests. I think it's much greater than that. Uh, we often have an elevated ferritin with normal uh, transferrin saturation. Again, the AST-ALT ratio is usually under one, where in alcoholic liver disease, it's greater than 1.5 to two. Imaging, you're gonna hear more about this afternoon. Uh, the ultrasound is the thing that's most widely done. Uh, we extensively use fiber scans that can tell us fibrosis and fat in the liver. There are a bunch of more sophisticated tests that are more expensive, but I think will be commonly utilized in the future. Next, alcoholic liver disease. So worldwide, about two billion people consume alcohol and about two million people die of liver disease annually. And it's estimated that about 50% of those deaths are due to alcoholic liver disease. So this is incredibly important. 
who gets alcoholic fatty liver? Well, this was a great study done by the late uh, Dr. Charles Lieber, where he hospitalized patients, and these were actually normal volunteers, fed them alcohol, high doses of alcohol for two weeks. And as you can see here, uh, people who were the normal controls had normal liver. People who uh, got alcohol for two weeks developed fatty liver. So heavy alcohol consumption over two weeks can give you a fatty liver. But the important thing is, if you take the alcohol away, the fat goes away. So what we're more concerned about are people who go on to steatohepatitis. And this is a working definition made by our NIAAA funded alcohol hepatitis consortium. So this is a clinical diagnosis. And alcoholic hepatitis is a clinical entity with the rapid onset of jaundice associated with liver enzymes that are mildly elevated with heavy alcohol use. And so the bilirubin is usually greater than three, and that's for mild, greater than five for severe, with a mildly elevated liver enzyme pattern with the AST greater than the ALT. So when we say patients are heavy drinkers, what do we mean? So drinks are different sizes depending on what your preference for alcohol intake is. So my particular preference is bourbon over here. So much smaller volume. They make that in Kentucky, by the way. Uh, maybe you like beer over here. So there's a great website, uh, the Rethinking Drinking, and that's shown here. And so that's an NIAAA website that tells you everything about alcoholic liver disease that you ever care to know. Now, should you feel guilty about going out to drink last night when you ate? Well, it depends on how much you drank. Probably not. So there's actually healthy drinking, and so that's important to know. So if you drink, if you're a female, one drink or less a day, a male, two drinks or less a day, that actually improves your overall survival, and you don't have an increased risk of developing liver disease. This is what our patients with alcoholic liver disease are drinking. On the average of 15 drinks a day, that's 2,000 empty calories, so that shows you why nutrition is important. You have actually the same thing in NASH in the United States with fructose consumption. Again, a lot of empty calories. What are the mechanisms? Well, this is a variation of a cartoon that I've used for a long period of time and we're only gonna go into one type of mechanism today, uh, which you've heard about a little bit from other speakers, and that's altered gut barrier function. But these are all mechanisms of cell injury. What we've ignored too much is liver regeneration in this particular disease process. So, this is our scheme of altered gut barrier function and our hypothesis that we've had for um, since the mid-1980s, that alcohol causes altered gut flora, altered mucin, altered gut permeability. You heard a little bit about this uh, from Dr. Sanyao with NASH. This causes increased endotoxemia, increased cytokine production, and subsequent liver injury, as shown in this cartoon here. This shows you recent unpublished data from our group. So a lot of the work that I've talked about with altered gut permeability has been in experimental animals. But here we have human data, again, from our alcoholic hepatitis consortium, showing increased endotoxin levels, uh, increased bacterial DNA in the bloodstream, and other markers of uh, gut permeability in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. Now, another study that we've recently published looks at an earlier phase of alcoholism. So these are heavy alcoholics admitted to a detox program, but they don't have significant liver injury. None of them have an elevated bilirubin. And you can see they have elevated endotoxin levels 
that uh, come down as the patients abstain from alcohol and improve. We then separated those subjects into ones that had mildly elevated liver enzymes or normal liver enzymes. The ones that had elevated liver enzymes are in black. You can see that they had the higher admission endotoxin levels and also higher levels of another bacterial product called flagellin. Well, it is not progressing here. So we not only have alterations in bacterial products, but we have alterations in bacterial products, uh, not only in the intestine, but also in the mouth. And these are recent unpublished data from our group looking at a oral bacteria that causes periodontitis, P. gingivalis, and we're showing higher levels in people with severe alcoholic hepatitis compared to moderate alcoholic hepatitis compared to healthy controls. And poor oral hygiene is frequently seen in alcoholic liver disease and in NAFL. There are also a bunch of disease modifiers that we need to think about. We've talked about continued drinking. Uh, certainly genetics is important for alcoholic liver disease just like it is for NAFL. Uh, smoking and obesity are big risk factors and highly modifiable risk factors. How do we diagnose alcoholic hepatitis? Well, in the United States, liver biopsy is not the standard of care. And that's because, number one, of sampling error. And this has been incredibly impressed upon me from liver explants that we get from uh, transplanted patients with alcoholic hepatitis, where in one area we'll see severe alcoholic hepatitis with fatty liver, another area you'll always see is scar tissue. And so remember with a liver biopsy, you're getting one fifty thousandth of the liver. So sampling errors are very easy. High cost in the United States, it's about $10,000 for a transjugular biopsy and up to one in 1,000 people could die from this. So we need new biomarkers and endpoints. And if you think about biomarkers, to me, that's like the American movie uh, Groundhog Day. We keep going back to the same thing over and over again. So this is a study done uh, 50 years ago where they looked at in-hospital mortality, about the same as now. People died of the same thing. And if you look at the last paragraph, an emission serum bilirubin greater than five that didn't begin to fall by a day six was a bad prognosis. So this is the early change in bilirubin that the French thought they discovered that we knew in the literature 50 years ago. So we clearly need new biomarkers and therapies. This is a recent study looking at all alcoholic hepatitis trials uh, since 1970. And again, you can see the one month and three month mortality has been fairly static. So I, I gave a talk to the NIH and to the FDA recently about biomarkers. And these are some of the different functions that we'd want a good biomarker to be, hopefully from a serum or urine sample. So, now in diagnosing alcoholic hepatitis, our current biomarker would probably be, our blood biomarker would be uh, an elevated AST or ALT, maybe the AST-ALT ratio. And then to figure out who had severe disease, we'd add in discriminant function or MELD. So shown here are two groups of patients. In red are, again, people from an alcohol detox program all with normal bilirubin levels, none with clinically relevant liver disease, and people with moderate or severe alcoholic hepatitis in the hospital. You can see the people in the detox program had actually the highest ALT levels, showing you ALT is worthless at uh, trying to point out how severe liver injury is. 
<laughs> so what's our biggest problem in uh, trying to diagnose alcoholic hepatitis and severe alcoholic hepatitis? Well, it's a patient with a high MELD who um, has bad alcoholic hepatitis versus a patient with a high MELD who basically has burnout cirrhosis. This guy will probably benefit from prednisone. This guy will get worse with prednisone. So how would we distinguish, distinguish those? Well, we think one thing might be the cytokeratin 18, a blood marker. So this is released from epithelial cells with cell death, and it's a substrate for caspase 3. So with apoptosis, why the cytokeratin 18 is cleaved and you get a smaller fragment. Uh, and so you can either measure the whole protein or the cleaved fragment. And this was done in a recent study published in hepatology, and all these patients had liver biopsy. So if they had a level of the whole fragment greater than 2,000, basically everybody had alcoholic hepatitis. If they were under 641, basically nobody did. And then there was a gray zone in between where they recommended liver biopsy as necessary and not just a blood test. They saw the same thing in a validation cohort. So does this translate to patients in the United States? Well, here's our current um, biomarker, the AST. Again, highest in people in the detox program with normal bilirubin. These guys over here have a bilirubin of 20. On the other hand, if you look at the cytokeratin 18, you see a nice stepwise progression and incredibly high levels in the severe patients, high levels in the uh, moderate. What about going on to personalized medicine? Because all these disease processes are actually multiple disease processes. And so you're going to probably have personalized medicine and companion diagnostic tests. So here's an example of something that we're interested in, because uh, our group's very interested in nutrition. So berries and pomegranate have this thing called elagic acid, which is metabolized by gut flora to this very beneficial thing, urolithin A. The problem is, if you treated everybody with this, you would probably get a negative result because there are some people that have gut flora that metabolize this to urolithin A, there's some that don't. But if you had a companion diagnostic test that picked out the producing and the non-producing group, why then you would have a beneficial drug, we think. And so we're looking into that. The last thing that we're going to touch on is toxic and associated pseudohepatitis. And you probably heard less about this. This is something that our group actually described uh, in hepatology in 2010. We took advantage of the fact that in Louisville, there was a uh, company that made automobile tires. And there was a lot of vinyl chloride exposure in the 1970s. And we found that there was a rare type of liver tumor, hemangiosarcoma, in people that had high exposure. And so for once, industry did the right thing. They pulled people out of the factories, and they got followed up. They had serial liver biopsies. Well, we went back in the early 2000s and looked at people that didn't have liver tumors. And it turned out that uh, over 80% of these highly exposed people had fatty liver, and actually 80% of them had steatohepatitis. And that's, in fact, despite the fact that they were not obese and weren't drinking. So this was a highly important observation. If we went on then to look at their liver enzymes, and this is the reason nobody picked anything up, their liver enzymes, the TASH patients have normal liver enzymes, AST and ALT compared to uh, chemical workers that weren't highly exposed or normal controls. But if we looked at the cytokeratin 18, why it was elevated. So it's a good biomarker for TASH, we think. And if we looked at all these pro-inflammatory cytokines that are important for alcoholic hepatitis and NAFL, they're highly elevated and actually higher than you see in NASH and often higher than alcoholic hepatitis. What are the mechanisms for environmental liver injury? Well, 
we think it's just like uh, alcohol and NAFL in a way. So you have a basic first hit, a high fat diet or obesity, and then you come along with a second exposure. And I'm using arsenic here, and again, there are problems with arsenic in Mexico, just there are, like there are problems in the United States. And so this is again a second hit mechanism. So if you think about it, we've done a great job of trying to decrease the pollutants in our environment over the past 50 years or so, but at the same time, our diet's gotten worse. So now what we're saying is you need less environmental toxicant because you have a worse uh, phenotype in your patient, so they're more likely to get liver disease. And so here we combined a high-fat diet and arsenic, and that's in the yellow, and you can see that those animals have the highest ALT levels, the highest TNF, the highest PI-1 levels, and low levels of the anti-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-10. So this is another environmental toxicant. Uh, PCBs are uh, polychlorinated by phenols, and they're dietary obesogens. And so we showed a very similar thing when you combined a high-fat diet plus the P PCB, you got terrible fatty liver and when you open the animals up, you have a lot of visceral adiposity and a very big fatty liver. And this is just a list of some of the environmental chemicals that cause fatty liver disease. These are some of the ones that we do most of our research on, but there's a whole host of chemicals uh, that everybody's exposed to that can cause fatty liver disease. How do we diagnose it? Well, here we have a real problem. We need new biomarkers because we said AST and ALT are not sensitive here at all. Um, so we've been looking at uh, lipidomics and we see some of the things that you see in alcoholic liver disease and NASH with some of these oxidized products of linoleic acid, eats and hodies being elevated. And so we think that by doing metabolomics, we're gonna find new markers for fatty liver disease. It'll probably be common to ASH, NASH, and TASH. So in conclusion, we have environmental chemicals that we actually haven't studied very well. We have food that we know is a big problem in the United States and Mexico, and alcohol that can all cause fatty liver disease and go through this whole similar spectrum of disease. So what we clearly need is increased awareness and we need new biomarkers. Thank you very much.